This is the 21.5 Show. You're on 121.5, the emergency frequency. Whether you're a professional pilot or want to be one, you're in the right place. Let's get started. Join professional aviators Dylan and Max as they talk their experience in the airlines, business aviation, and more. Life is good. Industry experts, unique stories, and plenty of fun. This is the 21.5 Show. Here we go. It is another episode of the 21.5 Show. 2-1 F-I-V-E. Two professional pilots behind the microphone. Doing our thing. For all of the professional pilots out there, welcome back. My name is Dylan, representing business aviation in the Challenger 350 Max. That'll be important information in a little bit. (laughs) My name is Max. I am in business aviation as well as the airlines. Representing the G280. G280 in this corner. Which we'll have to discuss just a minute. How was the Super Bowl, Max? Did you enjoy it? It was kind of a boring Super Bowl for 85% of it, wouldn't you say? It was a little slow, and then it got good at the end. I guess we should start off by saying the best part of the Super Bowl was that neither of us were trying to operate in and out of Las Vegas, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm not kidding. Can you imagine? That place has gotten to be such a mess. It's unbelievable. Even just normal, just a normal day. It's yeah, horrendous. And you're, that's not just for on the corporate side, because even at the airlines, aren't you getting pretty yeah, beat up when you go in there? Yeah, it's always flow times all yeah. the time. It's like you're going to LaGuardia. Yeah. Oh, it's like O'Hare was always been. <laughs> I can't remember if I told you this, my worst memory of the Super Bowl of all time. It was back when the Super Bowl was in Phoenix. I would say like maybe 2015-ish. That was the year on another side story where somehow you brokered the deal for the Maxim magazine party to be in your hangar. (laughs) (laughs) That was so awesome. I don't remember exactly how that all worked. Somehow we got tickets. I remember that. And Oh, well, that was part of the deal, yeah. obviously. Yeah. What a day. <laughs> Can you imagine that? I, that was so fun. Yeah. That was a mess. Yeah. We had like three hangers that the guy flew for owned, and we occupied the center big one, and we leased out the other ones. And so yeah. the guy that leased out the side ones, they were in like this luxury auto thing, so they didn't even have airplanes. And so I talked to him, and he knew somebody at Maxim, and there was a Super Bowl, and we had a party. I'm like, dude, we should have the party here. I'm like, can you find a place for all these cars? And he's like, yeah, can you find somewhere for the airplane? And I'm like, yeah. And so we negotiated. We got a great deal. I mean, they paid us a lot of money, and, but we had all the ramp space too. We like right. shut down our And taxi. you had like your own kind of private taxiway. Dude, this is when of. the Hellcat first came out. We yeah. were doing drag races yeah. down. It was oh, rides yeah. and two Hellcats drag racing down the taxiway. Remember we had a tethered hot air balloon yep. that was going up and down and mm-hmm. we had... Remember Nick Cannon was running around? Yeah, like, multiple <laughs> celebrities. I, like, yelled at, at you, wouldn't know who this is, Kirk Herbstreet, who's a uh, broad, college football broadcaster. I, like, saw him and, like, got him the a bunch of people. That we had, remember it was, like, free, oh. we had people giving away free watches, mm-hmm. free that with concerts and VIP. Yeah. It was a whole thing. It was thing. wild. That was a party. That was awesome. Yeah, if the Super Bowl's coming to your hometown and you got a hangar. Yeah, just you got a private that, hangar. Put that in your back pocket. There's a lot of really fun people looking to party. Yeah. <laughs> Those parties. So that was the fun part of the Super Bowl weekend. Then the downside was the next night I was flying charter at the time and someone had chartered our airplane to fly right after the Super Bowl, right? So if you don't remember, that Super Bowl was the Seattle Seahawks, which is my favorite team, versus the New England Patriots playing in Phoenix. And so, one, I couldn't go to the game because I was on standby to go book for this charter. And then, two... The Seattle Seahawks lost that game at the very last second. They were, like, supposed to run the ball. Marshawn Lynch just should have run the ball in for a touchdown. They threw this pass, and it got intercepted, this whole thing. And so that was just this major bummer. I'm standing. I remember I was at the landmark FBO ramp where they had, like, TVs set up for the pilots to watch. And I had my little Seahawks jersey and hat on. So I watched my team lose, blow it in the Super Bowl and like, the worst call ever. And then what happens? All the passengers, they're New England Patriot fans. They show up. And then I have to do a red eye to Naples. <laughs> and they're just in the back partying and celebrating their victory. And I'm just sitting there just staring into the abyss over the Gulf of Mexico. Just being like, what just happened here? It's <laughs> so funny. My son, he's in third grade. He's a big Chiefs fan. I, it's, oh, yeah. I still don't really know why. All, all kids are. But So his Valentine's box, you know, like when you're a little kid, you have a box you decorate for the, all the kids to put their Valentine's in. Okay. You know, his is a Patrick Mahomes. We have a face and this guy's curly hair, the whole thing, right? Okay. And uh, he comes out with this morning and his little Chiefs jersey on. I'm like, 
Well, this would have been embarrassing if we lost, wouldn't it? He's like, <laughs> yeah, I didn't think about that. <laughs> <laughs> and now he's going as the champion. Yeah, and now he's a champ. So Wow. I'll see. Think about all these kids that are getting hooked on football now because of Patrick Mahomes and Taylor Swift. It's unbelievable. Yeah, it's a whole nother. Good for them. Yeah, it's a whole, it's nother, a whole nother show. We're going to set that one aside. And uh, I didn't see a lot of the Super Bowl commercials. I watched some of them. Some of them were pretty good. But the advertisement I think that was the most interesting for our listeners was uh, Allegiant Airlines Pilot Union <laughs> that did the skywriting. Did you see that? Oh, yeah, I saw. I mean, this is going to sound completely ignorant, but I didn't even know they were in contract pilot negotiations. How dare contract you? negotiations, I know. Turn your back on the oh, brothers I guess I was just so concerned with the, the one that directly affects me for so yeah. long that it kind of blocked everything else out. It was like a, a really impressive skywriting, too. Our buddy sent us the link. We'll post the video link in the show notes. But it was like multiple airplanes right yeah it's like obviously on and off the smoke yeah. on and, and off it must be like it. all digitally controlled because yeah. it was like it it's was incredible cool. but it was you know saying uh allegiant pilots need fair contract now and i think multiple angles i'm assuming this was over vegas you know for the yeah, super bowl right pretty impressive at allegiant stadium yes know, so five points for creativity yeah well done <laughs> good. very good i hope they do get that contract don't you we all do now that you're aware that they're in negotiations totally now yeah. i'm big Big allegiance. Big proponent. Big G4 guy. All right. Lots to get to in the mailbag today. Some flight advice. We selfishly asked our own flight advice because we needed some information. Oh, no, <laughs> listen. We knew we were not the only ones. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Procrastinating and educating ourselves about this very important topic. So we'll have that for you. Mailbag, of course. Uh, but before we get into it, we had mentioned and we had alluded to in previous episodes that we're not sort of flying competitor aircraft, right? I'm in the Challenger 350. You've got the G280. And you have been keeping lists. You call me every once in a while and you'd be like, well, can the Challenger do this? Do you guys have this? What about that? Well, I'm just curious. Yeah. Because obviously if you're looking at a midsize, you're looking yeah. at both of those, right? And so it wasn't really up to me. He, the buyer was just like, he didn't want anything to do with the Challenger for whatever that. reason. Yeah. Okay. So you've compiled a list. You have some questions. We thought it'd be interesting to debate. Someone sent us um, a big debate on LinkedIn about this same thing. And I mean, they're very similar airplanes. I mean, one is clearly better, but... One clearly <laughs> looks better. I'll say that. <laughs> uh, I don't know. You know, the 280 is an acquired taste. I was yeah. like, at first I was like, God, this seems yeah. But now I'm like, I kind of like how it looks. Okay. So let's start off with, the, since we're talking about the exteriors and, and how it looks, the 280 has a very interesting stance, right? And if anyone hasn't seen it, it's kind of like nose low. So it's kind of pointing down a little bit, the several degrees when it's sitting on the ramp, which I actually think looks cool. What yeah. do you think about that look? Yeah, it kind of looks like a dragster. Yeah, so, I exactly. I mean, it's more the long nose on the front of it, too. Yeah. It's kind of strange looking. Yeah. It looks very different when you look at the in-flight photos. Right. Like, I noticed this when I was in training. You know, they have all the photos on the wall. Yeah. Where, you know, and I was like, the thing looks really cool when it's when the landing gear retracted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, does, it just looks different. I don't know. It I, sits much lower to the ground. It's actually cool. I looked at your door. It goes like much farther out because it's like a shallower climb. Yeah, I don't it's know really how to funny. That's it. the first thing that any owner of an airplane yeah. notices when he walks up to it. He's like, "Oh my god, this door! This is incredible." Yeah, especially ones that are advanced in their age. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because it's so. so easy to to climb. It's not like a legacy Gulfstream where you're. Yeah, you're going way up. So I will give you a point for that. The entry is better, and the door on the 350 just it hovers, doesn't it? Uh, yeah. Is there like a weight limit on that or anything? I'm sure there is one, but I don't think there's any way to know. It always used to make me really nervous when, like, especially in the Gulfstream, when you'd have all these, usually women, but sometimes men and women, climbing up on the door for the picture. Oh, yeah. I'm like, I was like, you can't, no, 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 no. <laughs> can you just see that thing taco? Oh, I know. 12 just people. Boom. Yeah, and then you're just like, oh, what just happened? Okay, so we'll give a point to the entry on the G280. And then, well, I guess we'll talk, uh, most importantly, when you turn left and get in the cockpit. Well, I will tell you this. The 280, they crammed as many of the cabin class... Yeah. stuff into the that airplane. Like, it still has, like, full... Like, even the galley, mm -hmm. it's stuffed with all the, the stuff. And the cockpit, kind of the same, I think. Yeah, the 280 definitely has some features that the 350 doesn't. What I think is interesting is now that you've flown... So, they're both Collins avionics, if you're not familiar with it. The 350 has the Proline 21 advanced avionics, and then the 280 has, I believe it's called the Fusion, right? That's kind of the next... Well, it's a version of Fusion. So it's like you've got the next generation of avionics in there, but I'm curious if you actually... With a Collins FMS. Right, Collins... Well, it's called, yeah. it well, is yeah, Collins. Yeah, Collins, yeah, sorry. Collins, yeah. Do you like 
that like next generation avionics where it's almost like you're using a mouse and a trackball and you're like clicking well, what's and the filling Pro line, in. The one that you, cause I've flown ProLine 21, but what's the difference between that and an advanced? Uh, it's got SVS in it basically. A couple oh. other things. Yeah. Not a ton. All right. So you've flown ProLine 21 also. Yeah. So I think the ProLine 21 is for me the pinnacle because it's super fast. You can do whatever you want with buttons and type and quick. You can go very quick versus these newer generation avionics they're a little bit more like software-y and layered where you've got to like scroll and click uh, and enter know data. I, disagree. I, think I don't know that I agree with that fully because okay. yes, there is a lot of clicking if yeah. you want to click. See, the other thing too is there's a there's another little display up on the glare shield yeah. that has a bunch of menus in it that also allows you to do a lot of the things with buttons okay. that you have to do with a cursor. Okay, It's awesome. And it's one of those things you have to learn how to use it. Yeah. And then you have to, you know, there's learning it in the classroom and then there's learning it by using it, right? Yeah. So it's kind of two levels of learning, like I would say with most avionics, right? Mm -hmm. And once you get to figuring out what you want, I mean, there's so many options of how to configure the screens and this and that, but we have it now like really dialed where we know what screens and, you know, and Christian and I are kind of the same level of tech. Okay. Which I think there could be a big disparity. You know, sometimes you're flying with a really old, pilot and really young pilot like the, people don't have yeah. the same appreciation for the tech so we do now we have like a memory setting when we're yeah. doing the takeoff brief a memory setting for the approach brief like yeah it has all the data up on the screens and the it's really cool you can literally click on the screen your route for a visual approach like infinite wherever you want it to go oh that's you can interesting. click so you can draw the, the route you oh. can put in the altitudes the speeds you can draw whatever you want and the airplane will fly it wow yeah so the for like certain we've done just just like for G Wiz yeah. factor, but we don't regularly do that or anything. But you can. I mean, it's it's really neat, and you can just click, you know, or like weather deviations. You know, it's so easy. Sometimes it's like, oh, just turn the heading bug. Like it's not that big right. a deal. But if say you're over the North Atlantic and you reported the next, you know, and you have to update your time. Well, if you draw it on the FMS, it will update your time crossing the next point, and then you can say, yeah. oh, is it within three minutes? And you can adjust your, you know, there's t- times like that when it's really nice. And then like we has this radar on it that. Gives you a, we have the a same vertical radar. display, it's though. unbelievable. Like, it's awesome. The 3D radars are incredible, right? Yeah. But this one, like, we have those on the 737, the new, the Maxes and stuff, and it's it's, it's awesome, right? And it's none of this tilting nonsense, yeah. right? But this thing, dude, it displays a vertical weather display on the VSD. Yeah, we don't get that. That's awesome. Yeah. That is cool. But, again, you have to know what it's showing you, which is fairly obvious in a radar, right? It's yep. showing you what's reflecting. That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be over the top of the storm or the convective activity. Right? Or it's going to be smooth. You're just over what's, yeah, being reflected. But if you know what the information is being provided, it's very useful. Yeah, I would definitely give the G280 a point there for avionics if you're willing to learn. It takes a little bit of a higher learning curve, but I think definitely more capable. And then you've got auto brakes, right? Yes. Yep, there's auto brakes, which is good because the brakes on this airplane... They're pretty touchy. Like on the 737, I rarely use auto brakes. Yeah. Unless there's a compelling reason to. But this, I always use auto brakes because it's just much smoother to interesting application of the brakes, okay. the way it does it too. And it's not, it's, it's fairly sophisticated too. Like when you touch down, it's not just like brakes on at a certain decel rate. Like it knows, you know, it doesn't add more brakes to you have the nose wheel on the ground. So. so you're basically just focusing on steering at that point? Yeah. I've never flown an auto brake airplane. So do you put your feet on the brake pedals? Are your toes on the rudders or yeah, your feet on the very on the... bottom? But uh, yeah. it, but as you add brakes, that's what kicks the auto brakes off. Oh. And so the thing is though, it's so funny because there's so many nuances. So in the 737 auto brake system, you have to add braking up to, as soon as you exceed the level of braking that the airplane is doing, then it will click off. Oh. Right. So that's a very seamless transition because you can make it so you don't even feel it. You just hear click and the auto brakes turn off, right? Got it. If you're smooth. This airplane, as soon as you apply brakes, it clicks the auto brakes off. So you can't just do a smooth application until you exceed the, mm. the braking level. You kind of got to learn how much brake to apply to get to where the airplane's braking, which that takes some ugly braking experiences to figure out. So that part I don't like about the auto brakes on the 280s because it's, you have to kind of grab brake. So it's because if you just add a little bit, you know, it'll be a big reduction in braking and then you adding brakes again and it no. looks really crummy. Okay. So you kind of have to figure that out. We have that, but you can figure it out. Now we have it figured out pretty good where you just add a substantial amount of brake to then get to the same braking level as it clicks off the auto brakes and then adjust it. Okay. It's so a little bit of touch. You can learn it. Little feel, little feel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We don't have to worry about any of that. So that's the good news. 
We just have monster carbon brakes that are but, really But, you know, good. It, you know, the thing that auto brakes are awesome is RTO, right? Yeah. But that's another trained thing. When you reject the takeoff, you don't want to hit the brakes, which is hard to do. And it, that's that's the thing in the sim. You will jump on the brakes and kick them off way too early. Then you then you figure it out and you learn, you practice. Is all, are your numbers predicated on the auto brake being on? Yeah, but there's so many things going on during an RTO that let the airplane do the braking. Right. It's the muscle memory you're fighting. Yeah, I'm imagine. doing it for the last yeah. 20 years, yeah. Okay. All right, so a few points. G280s are off to a strong start there with a few points. Let me review my list. Yeah, yeah, review your list. So we'll say exterior. I'm giving a point to the three, the Challenger 350. What's the story with auto throttles? So that's the newest model. The 3500 does have auto throttles. I have only flown the simulator of it. And, oh, no, I take that back. I have flown a 3500 I, as the SIC, not the PIC. And they work really well. Everyone has great things to say about it. You can do a single single engine auto throttle with it. So you can like do, do yeah, we do that stuff. Too. Yeah. So yeah, it's there. Okay. So I'm curious about this. When you do a uh, VNAV, mm-hmm. right? And you're doing a descent via with speeds. Yeah. Okay. So if you don't have auto throttles, mm-hmm. is there a cue that tells you when to reduce the thrust to idle or does it shallow your descent so you can slow to 250 below 10 or like? So we have, I'm going to say in the non-auto throttle airplane. Yeah. We have put the speed bug can be FMS controlled and it will dial your speed back to meet your restrictions. So if you just manually move the thrust lever to yeah. stay with the speed bug, it'll comply with everything you need oh. to do. And you'll get a little message on the FMS that says decelerate. So, so it'll you, basically be doing an idle or a, like a, a level change descent and you're just moving the power to make sure it... It's actually not... Well, com- that level no, change. It'll be no, on three one, degree or whatever, yeah, right? you, Like let's say you're in V-Path. Yeah. And you've set it, then yeah. And then it just starts winding the speed bug back okay, to where so you we just got to go. follow that. But you it's just still it. vertical mode. It's still, it's still maintaining a, a V path. It's, it's, it's just, still maintaining it's just your crossing restriction. the speed for you Correct. to maintain. Yeah. But it's not changing the pitch or anything because V path is complying with the altitudes. Yeah. If that makes sense. It's, it's interesting because, it, you know, they all, even with auto throttles without, they all do it differently. Yeah. And I think it depends too. Like, the 280 just sets up a default three degree, you know, it's yeah. a geopath. So it sets up a three degree, yeah. whatever you set, and it will reduce the thrust when it thinks it's appropriate, which yeah. is usually way too early. Um, but, but it's it very gets conservative. the job done. But yeah. then the 737 is all, uh, the way ours are set up is all idle thrust descents. So yeah, the whole right. Thing it's is totally based different. On idle thrust, but it will have decel points where it will like level uh... to decel and it calculates it really well. But well, that's your big problem, and that's the challenge I've heard with that the 737 is once you get off that, like if they don't let you descend when the computer planned to descend for whatever reason, they keep you high or you have to rejoin. Yeah, then your brakes out, it, the whole it's thing. A, it, that's, that's a challenge. Usually they'll give you, you know, uh, descend via or mm-hmm. highest discretion. So starting the descent at the appropriate time is not the problem. It's adjusting it. It's adjusting mm-hmm. That's where it gets Silly, because then you put it, okay, oh, now we're going to set it to setting at 280. They're going to have us descend at 270. Well, now it recalculates the whole thing for an idle thrust uh, 270 descent. And that makes, so sometimes it's interesting when you're on the arrival, like you could, there's like 900 ways to skin the same cat, you know? One of my favorite ways is like, especially if they tell you to speed up, is to just disconnect the auto throttles and add some thrust, right? Because then it just stays on this shallower descent path. Yeah. Right, and you just add a little thrust to the equation, and then that way, and invariably, in ten miles, when they slow you back again, then you just pull the thrust back and turn out the thrust back on. Interesting. So sometimes removing the automation is by far the easiest right method. That's to almost it, like, yeah. Versus you know rechanging yeah. your whole calculation. Yeah. Now I've got a question for you with auto throttles. With your co-pilot, this is his first experience with auto throttles. Have you guys talked about? the degradation and skill that you experience with oh, yeah. auto throttles and like how are you trying to manage that some way? What are your observations? So what we do at, at the airline, our policy is that when you disconnect the autopilot, mm-hmm. you also disconnect the auto throttles. Yeah. So there's no scenario on approach where you will disconnect the autopilot and leave the auto throttles engaged. We just don't do that. And I think that that is why. And so every flight you are forced to manipulate the thrust levers. When you're manipulating the most, mm-hmm. which would be on approach, right? Mm-hmm. So I told him, I'm like, you know, we should do this unless there's a reason, you know, we have the flexibility under 91, yeah. unless there's a real reason to leave the, th- the auto throttles connected for workload management or whatever, 
or like there's some great times. Like if you're doing a circle, right? Oh, you, know, you want yeah. all the heads out, you know, eyes outside looking yeah. at terrain, blah, you know, that's a great time to leave the auto throttles engaged, right? Or it's st- certain times like that. But most, I'm like, yeah, we should really be taking these off. And sometimes, you know, if it's windy or gusty and yep. it's about, the auto throttles aren't aggressive enough, blah, blah, blah. But so I've said, I'm like, you know, we should really do this. And because I get the practice, but you may not as much. And so, but we actually, to be frank, we've kind of gotten lazy and left them on. But I literally, the last one, I'm like, you got to start turning these things off, dude. You're getting lazy. I remember on at my old job, we did no auto throttle Tuesdays. <laughs> Every flight that was on a Tuesday was no auto throttle. That's funny. And In cruise too? Uh, maybe in cruise we turn them on. But like, calm down. calm down. But it's one of those things, like I'm a big like power setting person. So like I know in my airplane, you set it to 47% with normal weight and you're going to be very close to your approach speed every time. And so I will like to just on the 350, it works well. So as you're configuring, it's just slowing you down, but the hit, the thrust really never seems to change. And it works out so well because you're not, you know, constantly moving the power. But when with auto throttle for a long time, I didn't even know what, what thrust setting am I on a pro? I don't know. You know, I'm, I've dialed my speed, you know, that's it. And so it was like, I lost so much of that awareness you know, of like where you're kind of moving the power to. I don't know. That's funny because in the airplanes I fly, including yeah. my own airplane, the yeah. piston powered airplane, I still, I don't really know those. Like I remember when we were learning, remember it was like yeah. power to 1500. Then the, yeah. Like I have none of those power settings because. It, to me, I like to fly it that way because I know I'm always going to be in the ballpark and I'm going to be real close. And then from there, you can make just a real small adjustment. It's funny because mine is all like, in my head is all by the thrust lever angle. Interesting. Of which I've just learned. Yeah. And I know like to pull it to here or like when you're at idle trying to slow, because it's 737, you're always at idle trying to right. slow. And then like I know after flaps are selected, it varies a lot because two different types and varied weights and stuff. But even yeah. still, I know like boom, I bump it to here and that's darn close to get you like with the fine adjustment, you know? Yeah. And it's just like a memory thing, I guess. I think it's the same thing. It's getting yeah, yourself it's just, in the everybody ballpark. Does their own, yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of people also on visual approaches are like, okay, so I need to cross yeah. this many miles out at this altitude and blah, blah. And like some people, you just look outside and you just that's, figure it out. That's, and that's different how people fly. That's the whole reason I do it because I like to just set that thrust because I know I'm going to be there. And then that way I'm just fully just focused outside. outside. I don't yeah. have to look really yeah. inside much. So anyways, anything else you want to, I know we've kind of gotten into, off into a tangent more than I expected. I know, here on right. This. Um, <laughs> Well, what's the EVS and HUD situation? Yeah, they do have a HUD situation, I think, on the newest, the 3500 you can get. And EVS, no. Enhanced Vision. Uh, you know what? I don't want to. That's been around, I think, on the 2E yeah. for a long time. Ours does, is not equipped with that. Yeah. Which, like I told the owner, I was like, look, I would much rather have this upgraded radar than the HUD EVS. Yeah. Like we, I had it before in the 450. It's really cool. The amount of times it's going to get you somewhere where yeah. it otherwise wouldn't, or for our type of operation, it doesn't add a ton of value for the cost of installation and maintenance, but the the radar is... is yeah, awesome. the, that multi-scan radar is the best. Oh, yeah. here's the other thing. It, what about remote fueling? Can you set it from the cockpit? Can't set it from the cockpit. So that's one... Yeah, you get, you're going to get a couple points there. Okay, so it sounds like we're we're pretty G280 heavy here. But I'm going to tell you the major advantage of the Challenger. There's probably, what, three to one Challengers to G280s out there. Yeah, there's a lot more. more. That's for sure. There is a lot of those airplanes out there. And I think it's because, you know, they make a similarly capable airplane at a more compelling price point is really kind of the what it boils down to, I think. I don't know about that. I think that they compete on price. And I think Gulfstream's big. I don't think Gulfstream, frankly, this is not what anyone's told me definitively. Mm-hmm. Just the vibe I get is that they don't make much money on the, on the 280s. I think the 280, because yeah, of where they in, price the Challenger. Yeah. And I think that they just do it as a to feeder, rather yeah. market, market right. share to feed into their other airplanes. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I don't think they make a ton of money. They sell a ton of them, as many as they can make. People like they, it. Yeah. People yeah. Like but it. it's just a matter of, I don't think they're killing. I don't think yeah. it's their favorite airplane to be selling. Yeah. But they've done a really good job with it. There are some advantages when you have it massive economies of scale, right? There's a ton of pilots out there, a ton of airplanes out there. A lot of people know how to work on them. Parts. Yeah, well, that, or, <laughs> yeah, you know. That's a, that's a, well, parts that's, is an interesting thing, too, because if you know Gulfstream, you know that their support network is great, but you pay for it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's not cheap. So They'll fly a G-150 yeah. out with mechanics and parts yeah, and fixture. They'll take care of it. But they'll get you there. Yeah. It's just not going to be the cheapest uh, yep. endeavor. So interesting, yeah. But I think, you know, both of them are so, and we should mention it for any listeners that don't know, they have the same engine. In yeah, it. I was just going to say. 
literally the same. So the performance is pretty similar. I think the 280 has a, maybe can do a little bit more on the, um, I don't, I don't know. I don't really know. They say it's into... the highest power to weight ratio Gulfstream yeah. that they make. Yeah, because but... I think it's a little bit lighter. Because the 350 weighs to like 40,500 pounds takeoff. That's max. So I don't know if there's any. We're going to delete this since nobody knows what our takeoff weight is. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, well, doesn't the 280 hold a little more gas too? Maybe we're at like 14,000. Yeah, I well, know. We're like four, just over yeah. 14, too. Yeah, 39.6. So that's right. I thought it was pretty right close. There. I didn't yeah. Be quoted saying the wrong. Yeah, I know. I did look up that there is EVS on the 3500, which I do not fly. So, so yeah, they're really. pretty darn close. Yeah. But it's funny because someone sent us a LinkedIn and you have so many people have like these really strong opinions on this one way or another. And it's just like your boss, you know, you just had a really strong opinion on yeah. one over the other. And it's like, man, they're almost the same, you know. They, well, let's look at it from the cabin perspective, too. Yeah. Go ahead. I know you have some thoughts here. So obviously last thing on, or the most noticeable thing is the flat floor in the 350 versus the sunken floor on the 280. And it's interesting with the way you explained it was that the seats are actually sit higher in the cabin in the 280. So it's in the more rounded part of the fuselage. So they're actually farther apart. Yeah. Which I never really thought about, but it makes sense. And then also, when you're walking, if you're a tall person, right, right, it, then you're getting that cabin height. So it's height. a flat floor. I wonder, more similar to where the sunken floor is, or the seat height in the. Mm, I would think it'd Probably be more the sunken, sunken floor. That's yeah, what I would, that would be too, my but. guess. To me, I I can't see like a huge that a big advantage deal? to a flat yeah, floor. I don't, I don't know. Maybe it is. Maybe a lot of people trip. I, I think get, it's a personal preference thing. Maybe yeah. I don't know. But well, let's get to the most important thing of all, and Max, and that's the lavatory. Go ahead. <laughs> Hey, yeah. Like I said, they I think they crammed a lot of the big airplane stuff, which yeah. is inclusive of the vacuum toilet. Oh, and it's pretty sweet. Very important. Can you airborne purge all of the water? Mm -hmm. This is something that the 350 has that I love. The water is in a tank in the back with like the release of like two straps. You just disconnect the tank and you can bring it inside. What? How many it, gallons is it? That's maybe five. That's it? Oh. Yeah. Oh, it's because it doesn't use it for the toilet. That's why. Right. Well, ours is like 10. It's not that big. Oh, yeah. But it's installed. But you can, there's a whole touchscreen yeah, panel, and you, you can know, purge, and you can just yeah. purge. You yeah. know what else is really cool? When I used to do a lot of the cold weather ski trips and stuff, where yeah. you have to park the jet outside because the hangers were all full, you mm -hmm. know? And you dump all the potable water and it took nine years. And like, especially yeah. in the G3, it's like, yeah. you know, it's on the ground. It's yeah. burping water. It took forever. Yeah. 450, you could just hit a button, right? Yeah. But uh, this airplane, when you go to service it again, it's always the potable water service stuff was always frozen, right? Yeah, right. Yep. And all those are heated. Oh, so you see, fire that's it up really on the ground. Nice. You just like just give us like ten minutes, and then it it'll, then it'll be ready. Yeah, oh, see, that's super that's nice. Cool. I've run into that problem before. Yeah, we still have to purge the sink, you know, get the water out of the lines. But yeah, you can just take the thing off, and it makes it so much easier. And what's also nice is if you ever need to service the potable water, you can go do it yourself in a couple minutes. Versus oh, we're gonna get the cart and blah, blah, you know because. Of course, you never realize that you, the potable water needs to be serviced until, you know, the it's 15 minutes before the passenger, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so and you're, you're like, oh. so We're pretty like, good about getting, yeah, and you can service it from inside, too, yeah. like gallons of water if you're somewhere right, where they don't right. have the equipment exactly. or whatever. But, yeah. So, yeah, that vacuum toilet. Yeah, the vacuum is, toilet, though, they, is pretty money. <laughs> There's still more meat on this bone, but we got a lot to do here, and we don't have a lot of time, so Quickly. we have to move on. Write in and tell us what we forgot in the comparison of the uh, 280 and the, the 350. You could tell our knowledge of these airplanes is vast and incredible. We basically built the airplanes. Yeah, right, exactly. Less than a year of experience on them, but uh, you can't go wrong either way. I mean, they're... So let me ask you this, because see, I personally think flying an airplane of that size is like the sweet spot. I'm just like, this is so cool. It's not too big. You can still get into most places, but it's big enough that you're in the cabin. It's fairly capable. You can pretty much do anything you want with that airplane. I agree. You can that do size, I think, is all, just almost perfect. Most everything. Yeah. You can still get into smaller airports. I will tell you that 280 is probably the most fun corporate jet I've flown. Yeah. Like just how it flies very responsive and it does have ridiculous amounts of power. Like yeah. if you just climb the thing, a climb thrust. Yeah. And level change. It's unreal. It's uncomfortable for some people, the yeah. deck angle. Yeah. The, the people I fly for love it. They think it. They're like, oh, I'm like, you know, if you ever want, that's too much. Just let you like, no, 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 we love that part. It's awesome. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Just Oh, interesting. Like, there's this departure out of John Wayne. Yeah. And it keeps you like 220 or 210 or something yeah. for really, until you're really high. Yeah. Right? And we were so above 
the Min Crossing. Alexi, we're we're already level at the top of the Sid before the Min Crossing. And you look back at the airport, and you you're not that because it like goes straight out, then turns yeah. like a hard right or something like that. It's when you're departing off the twos, right? Oh, to the yeah, north, yeah. which I you don't do very often. So I I don't think I'd ever done that. And you turn, make the turn, you look back. And you're like, God, what have we done? How are we so high already? And it, uh, you know, we weren't that heavy, granted. And it was yeah. cooler time of year, all the things, but still, yeah, it was just, just ridiculous. Every dude. element. And we were just climbing so slow, but so pitched up. And I was like, even I was like, God, this is, when is this going to end? <laughs> but I'm like, I'm not going to stop it. <laughs> we're just going to keep trucking. Yeah. Yeah, it is really impressive. All right. Lots more to get to. What have you done? You did something to our reviews, and I'm not exactly sure. I can't remember what it was, but we received like five reviews. And I'm going to make you read every single one of them because well, I, was, I don't know what you said. It was because the last time we did this, and there was the one where the dude was a Gen Z, wrote it, for yeah. the, uh, had ChatGPT oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. write it, we thought, right. from a Gen Z's perspective. And it had all of the keywords of the day except for slaps. I'm like, if that thing would have just said how this podcast slaps, that would have been funniest, which is, you know, I do not say in my normal life. But so everybody, <laughs> so the, and, and Dylan forgot about it. He goes, I don't know what you said. In the last episode, we've got all these reviews <laughs> that say, this podcast slaps. <laughs> Best aviation podcast ever and equally great podcast for restaurant recommendations. Another one, title also, this podcast slaps. <laughs> Let's keep this review short and sweet. This podcast slaps. Enough said. Amazing. This podcast slaps. A joy to listen to every time. Next one, title, this podcast slaps. This podcast slaps. Hosts are well-spoken and the audio quality is amazing. Thanks for all your work. <laughs> Oh, you can read the last one. Okay, last one. Top 40 aviation podcasts. One of my favorite podcasts to listen to when I run or on my commute to work, as the youths would say, it slaps. <laughs> and it's straight fire, bro. <laughs> Currently a navigator in the Air Force making the jump over to commercial aviation with my GI Bill. The podcast is super funny. Max and Dylan's banter is hilarious. And the show is super informative on the state of the aviation industry. Thanks for producing this awesome podcast. Because of it, I reached out to Diamond Dog James O'Neill and Raven Careers for career advice on making the jump to chase down my dream job of being an airline pilot. All right, James, we'll be waiting for a commission check on that one. Thank you. All right, those reviews are from Andrew Meyer, PNW, get about it, P. McEwen, GC Rick 22, and Jimmy Dean. Thank you to everyone who wrote in. Send us an email info at 215podcast.com and we'll send out some stickers to you for the review. Yeah, slap. It's slapping. Boom. On to the mailbag, which is, of course, brought to you by our friends at Advanced Air Crew Academy, aircrewacademy.com, where you can see all of the offerings they have for training opportunities for your flight department. Those online modules are so convenient. You can just shoot them off to your people. Mm -hmm. I'm currently You're up in to my one. neck in Advanced Air Crew Academy modules myself. Yeah. Have you found any hacks to where you can, like, skip no. through all the slides? No, they've future-proofed that for me. It is not like... Uh, CTS back in the day or something. <laughs> where can... Real estate continuing oh, education. Oh, yeah. It's nothing like that. Dan doesn't let you cheat. Well, actually, That's... I take that back. You know, I think you actually could. This is actually an endorsement that was unintended, but I don't think there's a minimum time requirement to spend on each page. Yeah. You just have to answer the little quizzes, I think, is they're like, you know, how they right. make sure you're yep. doing it. But So I think you could click through, but I actually don't. Oh. Because it's like, I know. Stuff is actually useful. Yeah, useful. Right. And, and I actually feel like an obligation to read. It's not like the real estate continuing education I've done yeah. 900 times, and it's the same thing. Well, at plus, it, the way they deliver it, it's, it's interesting, too. It is. It's, it's not mind-numbing. There's like little video. Yeah. I even find myself watching the little embedded videos and what, stuff. did you hear that, Some Dan? It's really interesting because it's like shows the traffic flow on certain, like, international routes. And you're like, who's flying, you know? How many airplanes are really flying from here to South America? On it? And you're like, you're like wow. How many how, there's so many people need to go everywhere. It boggles my mind. But hmm. anyway, it's good stuff. It's pretty funny, though. It must be painful for them because as soon as you get this, like, email where, they, you know, they North Atlantic OPSEC 007 or whatever yeah. it is, the document that governs the rules, they're like, oh, we're doing away with uh, oceanic clearances. And you're like, And oh. you're like, and I'm literally in this thing. It's like, oh, you have to get your oceanic clearance between 30 and 90 minutes. You need to request it here. And if you cannot be a chef and if you can't do it via data, I bet they're just like, ah. Now we got to go through this now we again. we got to remake all this. Uh, oh, that's tough job. That's Someone's a tough job. Someone's got to do it. They do a great job of well, it. AircrewAcademy.com. Thank you for your longtime sponsorship of the mailbag. Okay. Exciting news, Max. An please. email from a longtime listener, Rick S. He says, Dylan and Max, your current podcast with Brian Baumhoff was terrific. Mental health is such an unseen problem, and 
does not surface until it is most likely too late. We aviation professionals are forced to cloak our issues in favor of our career. It is so sad that when we have a physical medical issue, we can see a healthcare professional and be treated, often easily returning to flight status. In the recent uh, past, we had a pilot with a stroke and one with a heart condition, both returning unrestricted to the cockpit. We are reluctant to seek mental health help because we may end our career with treatment that is likely to have not real impact on our ability to our, do our jobs. If you can think of a way, I would like to offer a pledge challenge to your listeners. I am willing to match one-to-one to PMHC up to $1,000 for money you can raise in an upcoming period. And that's from Rick. So Rick is going to donate up to $1,000 to Rick, match Rick, yeah. putting his money where his mouth is. Unbelievable, that's Rick. That's what I Thank said you last so time. I'm like, yeah. you know, everybody's very passionate about this. Yeah. But when it's time to pull your checkbook out, people sometimes find the limits of their passion. Not this uh, time. Not Rick. And we and we said, too, we put our money. We made a donation. Absolutely. Uh, from the show. And uh, we would encourage you to do the same. So Brian and PMHC are working with Rick to set that up. They're going to have a special page for the listeners to go to. And we're waiting for that to come through. Hopefully, we'll have it by the time this episode goes out. It'll be in the show notes. We'll be very prominent there for you to go and send your match donation there. They're probably going to have a specific campaign for that. It sounds like the those details are still being ironed out at the time of this recording, but probably by the time the episode is released, we'll have all that detail and the socials, everything. We're going to promote it. Yeah, we're going to blow it up. And it would be really, if you've already made a donation based yeah. on the, the previous podcast, let us uh, know. If you can, yeah, send us a note because we'd like to count that into the yeah. total, yeah. just to see what the impact is from what we're trying to do here. Absolutely. And support the people that are actually making meaningful steps to get something done. So please send us a note. Let us know if you made that contribution. If you haven't yet, maybe hold off until we provide the link. Yeah. So uh, I have a feeling it's going to exceed yeah. uh, get Rick's ready, very Rick. generous match. So let's let's do this. I think we should see how far we can get this. Because Absolutely. if it's not something that's important to you now, it could, could become be. very important to you. Exactly. In the future. Rick, thank you so much for your generosity Thanks, and awesome. uh, everything you've done for uh, folks in business aviation. All right. More emails. You want to read? It's a long one, but it's about your boy, Ken Minus. Dear Max and Dylan, a couple summers ago, I had the pleasure of loading Ken's Blue Thrush. Sidebar, Ken is the crop duster pilot that we interviewed. Yeah, Ken, yeah. crop duster fly pilot, also dropped uh, neutered fruit flies from a King Air 350 over yeah. the uh, Great LA Basin. And also the developer of the Turbine Moose, which I, that one, I, the, and I flew his with him on floats, whatever, a month ago or something. Yeah. But anyway. All right, a couple summers ago, I had the pleasure of loading Ken's Blue Thrush, which is an ag airplane. One day, I was loading him by myself. After pushing the concentrated chemical into the airplane, I switched the valves to send water to the specified amount, about 350 gallons in his 500-gallon airplane. The problem was that I couldn't see the water line through the hazy fiberglass window that usually only worked at sunrise with the light shining horizontally. I was waiting for Ken to call it as the pilots have a window right in front of them, but he must have been busy planning how to fly his next load. After a while, I knew it must have been high, so I called it quits and stumbled up to the airplane looking like Walter White covered in a plastic chemical gear and told him I can't see anything. He goes, well, take a look, and opens the large hydraulic door in front of him. Sure enough, it's filled to the brim. I ask if we should reverse the pump and take some back, and in a nonchalant tone, I'll never forget, he goes, nah, she'll haul it, closes the door, <laughs> powers up, and taxis off. <laughs> that sounds like him. Even though I had yet to become a pilot, I knew density altitude was a major factor as the high desert of southern Idaho was three to 4,000 feet and 90 to 110, meaning 5,000 plus density altitude. My knees were shaking as he taxed out of sight down the cresting runway, and I sat thinking this rookie mistake of mine might get him killed, and I'd hate to live with that. Our loading site was just right at the departure end of the 3,000-foot runway, and sure enough, Ken came by just squeaking it out of ground effect, turning right away. Who knows if he was pitched for VX. Could have had plenty of energy and decided to accelerate to get to the field instead of climbing. That's par for the course in ag flying. In exchange for the story, I would like some flight advice. Oh. I'm a 1,300-hour total-time turbine skydiving pilot with an end goal of net jets or airline based in Orlando. A year ago, it seemed that candidates like myself would have options at 1,500 total time, but those days are quickly changing. Back then, I turned down a small Part 135 Learjet job that came with a year training contract in hopes of landing one of the above-mentioned jobs within months. This has me in between the rock and a hard place as my hours and subsequent pay has been cut drastically for reasons out of my control. Wondering what the best way to play my hand of cards. Look for a similar sub-1500 hour Part 135 job now or wait till reaching 1500. And if nobody calls, then any ideas that it would advance my career like a multi-crew jet job but would also be an adventurous side quest. 
subsequent sacrifices like location and pay are fine. Mm. So the only problem is, so Sky Dame Pot, we just let's just make an assumption of what the rate at which he is increasing his time. I mean, it is, even still, like assuming he's a full time pilot, like to close the gap on two hundred hours can't be that long, right? Like, yeah. to get to 1,500 hours total time is going to open up You're, a lot of it's doors. It's going to open up a lot of doors. The only problem is I just don't know about the quality of that flight time from a recruiter standpoint. Have you flown anything IFR professionally? Well, that's the thing. That's what's changing. Before, it didn't, yeah. you know, six months ago, it didn't matter. Yeah. It was 1,500 total time, whatever. I mean, you may have been able to. Did you? Like, who knows? I need a little bit more knowledge about what you've done. Like, did you fly private pilot until about 400 hours and then you've been flying skydivers the entire time? Yeah, or a flight instructor, light aircraft. And this is probably his first job. Like, yeah. why, why would you, you know? Well, that's what I'm saying. Did you see a fire did you, or not? Because I think that's a big difference too. Yeah, I don't know that that's, it's relevant, but I don't know yeah. that it's like game changing okay. relevancy. Okay. I think you wait till 1500 because at the end of the day, yeah. the, the lowest restriction is always the right well it's either the regulations or insurance either way those are cut and dry black and white numbers right it's not a matter of a lot of times the quality of the time it's just a time requirement so yeah. i think you're so close to getting to the 1500 mark that opens up so many doors for yeah you know maybe you're not going to go to a major airline anymore definitely not but the thing is it's not like covid or 9-11 like you know the guillotine didn't drop here like if things yeah. are, are transitioning they're not this is what you have Falling to do. Cliff. You actually think of this as a gift. You have 200 hours to go, okay? Uh, we don't know how fast you're, you're going to this. We'll, we'll say it's probably at least going to be four months, five months, probably. This is your time, especially for NetJets. This is your time to start networking right now. You need to be talking to career coaches and NetJets recruiters. And going to the uh and Going to the fairs. job fairs, Isn't whatever NGPA? NetJets is. Which is National Gay Pilots Association and yeah. Newsflash. You don't have to be gay to go. Yeah, anybody can go. This is the time for that. You need to be talking to those recruiters right now and find out what they want to see. Hey, I've been flying skydive. I've got 1,000 hours of skydive time. Is that going to be competitive? And if they're like, mm, no, we got to see some instrument time or something else, okay, then there's going to be your answer on some of this. So I think that the job fair networking career coach that's the angle to take. Well, because right that's the thing. The things are changing, but they are changing yeah. pretty quickly. Yeah. Again, not falling off a cliff, but things are changing. And so yeah. if you're going to be like, okay, well, you can get to competitive experience requirements for NetJets fairly quickly. And it may mean another job. It may mean going to fly for a mirror flight, who knows, yeah. whatever, you know, and you may be able to get to NetJets. And if that's maybe your end goal, then go fly there because guess what? You could always leave mm -hmm. once you ba get some more time and go to the airlines if, if they're still yeah. hiring at the time or when they do hire again or whatever. That would probably would seem like the most attainable goal, especially like we said, the music's slowing down. It's always good to be at a job where you feel like you can sit when the yeah. music stops for a while and be comfortable from a yep. quality of life and monetary standpoint. So, But I do think to go to your point, there is a certain law of diminishing returns at the skydive job. I agree. You can only get so much time there. 200 hours. Yeah, get that. I'd probably yeah. knock that out, and in the meantime, like work, you said, work on yourself. Don't yeah. get to fifteen hundred hours and be like, okay, that now what do I do? Yeah, like, you should already know. Like the we day should. you get that fifteen hundred, you yeah. should have your plan. You should have out. already be talking with recruiters. Should know your interest, especially if you want to go to NetJets. Be, the recruiters should know who you yeah. are. I mean, what literally, you're doing. if you don't want to Boom. engage a career coach, at yeah. very mid, bare minimum, Google yeah. aviation career. Get on LinkedIn and start connecting with people at NetJets. Yeah. That's what I would yeah, start doing. Start there. That's you can do that tonight. Yeah, and then and start being like, know, hey, go to events yeah. where you can get in front of yep. them personally. That's yep. always better. And 100%. start building your strategy. There you go, Nolan. Hopefully that helps. Thanks for the story about Ken. And just so you know, Ken is one of those dudes that's like he knows the performance of his airplane. Oh yeah, like that probably wasn't the first time Ken's ever had to haul that load off no. that runway at those temperatures. He knows. Ken <laughs> knows. Means, so the amount of reps he would tell me that they would never shut the engine down for like. Oh, I mean, he talked like about 20 it. hours yeah, or some crazy thing. Longer than that, I think. Yeah, yeah I don't know. It's Unreal. wild. Next email. Hey, guys, we've heard you go in depth on short sleeve versus long sleeve and your lanyard versus clip. What we need to know is if you're commuting in the jump seat on an airline you don't work for on a jet you may or may not fly, are you plugging your headset in? Big fan of the show. Keep up the hard work. Thanks, Jared. That was funny. I remember getting this and you replied to him and you're like, short sleeves and clip. Or something. Yeah, I'm like, I didn't no, that's not what he's asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said we've settled the I debate screwed that on one this. Up. A sidebar, 
Someone actually sent us a message on social media asking if you were wearing long sleeve pilot shirts. Never. I've never even bought one. Yeah, I don't know why they asked. I think they confused you with Roy because our buddy Roy. Yeah, Roy is a big long sleever. He's a long sleever. Max and I are short sleeve guys. Anyways. Short sleeves. But you do have to apply sunscreen. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, now back to the question at hand. You're jump seating. Do you plug a headset in? I mean, I know what I'm going to say. Uh, that's a negative Ghost Rider. <laughs> well, I take that back. If you're very new to flying the airlines or whatever, like there's a certain amount of watching other people do the gig that's beneficial. So if you think you can get something out of it. Especially if it's like the same airplane you fly and yeah. you're brand new and you're like, oh. Or airport that you're operating out of. If yeah. you're going into O'Hare and you're you yeah. show up for IOE, like, yeah, plug in. Yeah, <laughs> Check it for out, sure. You know, but. Once you know what you're doing. Yeah, I, I think once you're past that. I mean, if the captain ever asked I, I you think, to. I, like, I, I'll I tell you this. Say I'm operating the flight and we have a jump seater and he gets the headset out and plugs in. I'm, I'm cool. certainly not offended. No. I don't, I'm, like, like, I'm not like, what is this guy doing? Make sure if there's an option in the intercom, turn the hot mic off. Yes. No one wants to listen to you breathe and do not talk unless you have something interesting to say. So that would be the only red flag. Obey the rules. Like if, if I was wallets. the captain and, and somebody's plugging in the headset and I don't really know why and I'm just like, is this person going to try and chat with me the whole time? Yeah, but you're not going to sit. You just sit and if he does, be like, hey, dude, let's. Uh, if you're going to do it, this is what I would disclaim. Hey, guys. I'm just learning the plane. I'd love to, if you don't mind, I'm just going to listen in. I'm just trying to, you know, get my procedures up. Or I've never been to this airport. I'd love, you know, I would probably say something. Now that I think about it, literally in the last few weeks, I think I did have. A jump seater plug-in. Uh, yeah, but he was very new, like yeah. just off IOE or whatever. Yeah. And so it was kind of obvious why he was plugging sure. in is to see. And maybe just say, I'm going to just, just want to learn, you know, I'm just trying to pick some tips up, you know, pointers or whatever. And I want to say, totally you know, fine. I'm going to say I made did that, done that. Because it's one of those things when you go through school. And all of a sudden, you go through the sim, and then you go to yeah. real life, and then there's all these questions of like, how does everybody else actually do this? Yeah, you know, so. it can be very useful. Just maybe throw anyway, a disclaimer out. Anyway, the answer yeah. to your question is use your discretion. I don't think anyone will find it offensive. Either. Yes. Last one. Hi, Dylan. Thanks for sharing my experience on the podcast yesterday. I should have mentioned that ExpressJet was in the ugly phases of the ASA merger. It was a mess. Management nearly named the combined company SureJet. LOL. I did think about going to professional standards, but I didn't think it would have been heard because of the blending of the two different operations. Another captain I was close to advised talking to the chief pilot. I appreciate the discussion. Definitely the best aviation podcast. Love it. Okay. And that was in relation to the conversation we had with the pro standards pilot. Right. Yeah. Sure, Jet. I remember that. <laughs> you do? Yeah. When they were like going through different options. And then remember the Express Jet came out and their logo looked like Colgate toothpaste. Yeah. Do you remember that? It was like Yeah, the when their own, they were yeah. running their own deal. It was hilarious. Good idea. What a time. Yeah. So definitely more to this story as there usually is. Thanks for the follow-up on that, Sean. You know what I think is kind of ironic is that remember Express Jet's like, oh, we're going to run our own airline, you know, and do our own thing. Yeah. And that, that didn't work out. But I think what's really funny is that uh, Big Stripe. JSX is using a lot of X Express Jet airplanes. Oh, yeah, to do doing the same their thing. own thing. Yeah. That seems to be working. Full circle, bro. Yeah, full circle. There you go. It's aviation right there for you. Okay, that is going to do it for the mailbag. If you would like to get involved in the conversation, info at 215podcast.com is the address. I have a feeling we're going to get a lot of emails about this jump seat headset thing. Good. Yeah. So, we are not the. Yeah. So, we'll have more discussion about that in a future episode. Up next, Max. Flight Advice, which is, of course, brought to you by our friends at Harvey Watt. HarveyWatt.com, you can log in and check out all of the offerings they have. It's not just for airline pilots. If you're in business aviation, you can go on and use the little calculator, put in your age, put in your target retirement goals, and it will spit out what your premium is going to be. You can take that, take it to your boss, try and negotiate that in your next compensation package, maybe. It can just come right out of your paycheck. Right out of theirs. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think, you know, I think the thing that's interesting is, like, we have somebody at our airport that's doing mm -hmm. this where pilot had a heart attack. Now he's on a medical. Yeah. And, like, especially if that pilot's been there for a while and you're the owner, like, what, that puts you seriously between the rock and the hard place. Yeah. And uh, I think you can offer this as not, a, you know, a selfish enhancement to your own security, but be like, look, dude, what, like, what would you do if, Yeah. You, I don't think that's a decision you're going to want to have to make. Like, exactly. Let's take the burden off. Let's take the burden off, and then you can stop paying me if I go out and pay a contract guy and hold my job for me, of course. Yeah. While I work through the FAs. I'll still attend the Christmas party. Very time-consuming process, and uh, then I'll come back. Yeah. 
win for everybody. RVWatt.com to get your journey started to protect your career. All right, Max, selfish flight advice today. We both are going to be flying to Mexico soon. We've heard the rules have changed with the permitting process to get in there. Um, so we had to go uh, reach into the Rolodex and call our friends over at uh, ITPS, International Trip Planning Services, one of the experts on operations in Mexico. And so Ben Fuller is going to join us and uh, explain the new process. Yeah. If you remember, that's why one of the reasons we started this podcast is because Personal the game. burden is on yeah. you, as especially <laughs> as a Part 91 operator, yeah. to educate yourself on changes in the business. And I know we're not the only ones getting some of these emails and know that there's something has changed, but don't exactly know yep. until you get the trip. And all of a sudden it's like, it becomes your most important research project of the week. So we're trying to get ahead of that for ourselves and for those of you that are in the similar situation. So here we go with Ben. Here we go. All right, uh, Max, we're so excited to be joined by Benjamin Fuller. He's the operations manager for International Trip Planning Services. Welcome to the program, Ben. Uh, thanks, guys. I appreciate it. So, Ben, I got to make a confession. I fly to Mexico all the time, and I was a little caught off guard with these recent changes to the permitting process to get into Mexico. I was under the old, you know, single permit. You get that, or you get the multiple entry permit, which is good for the year. And all that changed starting in uh, 2024. So can you get us up to speed? Yeah, I, gu I guarantee you, Ben, everybody else is doing the same thing. We see these emails. We're like, oh, wow, yeah, that looks like something you need to pay attention to. But nobody pays attention to it until like you yeah. know, a week uh, or you get a Mexico trip or you're within like seven days. And all of a sudden, it be so suddenly becomes the most important thing in your life. <laughs> so right, right. we're trying to get ahead of that for us and the rest of the listeners. So Because there are timelines and things I've seen snippets of, too, that are very important with this whole thing. So absolutely. And, you know, I was glad Mexico at least let us have the holiday travel before they turn this over to something else. But they have made some changes. And as historically, as you can imagine, anytime a change trickles through, it takes time to reach every single airport in Mexico, because unlike a lot of countries around the world, Mexico does things a little differently. And the fact that each airport might have a little bit different interpretation of the civil aviation law. So they had gotten together and, and actually updated their aviation law in May of 2023. And it took a few months to get together and decide how we're going to interpret this, how are we going to update the requirements for entry into Mexico. So you're correct. Uh, the permits have changed. And what's going on now is for our Part 91 private operators out there, we no longer have the ability to grant blanket permits, which means that every time you travel there, you, we need to review the trip itinerary, the documents, make sure that those single entry authorizations are in place for the travel. Does that mean that the process has changed? The timeline has changed? Walk us through some of the nuts and bolts on what we need to do. Yeah, absolutely. So there has been some changes. Your standard documentation is still required. However, they are asking, in addition to the ILS license, medicals, aircraft registration or worthiness insurance, your special Mexico insurance. Now they'd like to see a interior diagram of your aircraft. They want to see sometimes based on the Comandante and the local airports regulations, an exterior picture of the aircraft. And so uh, just a couple of added amendments to the documentation. Now, as far as timelines, they're still short overall if you compare them. People are used to getting permissions within hours, which is still possible. What we're recommending, though, is to allow at least the business day to get things in place because this has only been in process now a few weeks. And we are still seeing some, some local commandantes and authorities that are a little bit shaken up by this as well and kind of want to push their weight around and try to hold the aircraft on departure back out of Mexico to the U.S., so while the timelines in theory have not changed, we, we do recommend that you do allow a little bit longer of a time frame to make sure that we do have everything in place. And so with these single entry authorizations, the big change that a lot of people that are, the, the, a lot of the confusion is coming from the fact that it used to be you get your single entry authorization, you go to Mexico, you return, you're finished. Let's move to the next one. Okay, you get another one-time permit, single entry authorization. You go, you come back, finish. Well, now they're considering these single entry authorization entries as 180 days of uh, valid validity. So we're saying, okay, is this 180 days 
validity for the company, for the aircraft that's operating, for the people that are on board. And we've got about 27 different answers. <laughs> so, <laughs> so here's the tricky thing now. What does this permit mean and what does it get me authorization to? So <laughs> that's a great question because it depends on It gives on you which... authorization to pay a fee, my friend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. It's coming down to, okay, what airport are we going to? What are they interpreting this as right now? Will they all be on the same page eventually? Yeah, probably so. But are they right now? Absolutely not. Okay, so you're saying if I'm going to Cabo, it's up to the Comandante in Cabo how they're doing it. But if I go to Puerto Vallarta, that Comandante may have a different interpretation. Is that the level of where this is can change? Absolutely. And I know that a lot of our colleagues and business partners in Mexico are just as frustrated as we are in the United States because they're having to go through the same processes. And as you may or may not know, the entity AFAC, which is the Mexico Civil Aviation, is based in Mexico City. So every agent, everybody has their people in Mexico City that are negotiating these things straight with AFAC and with the people there to help pay for the permits and for the any NAFIs and that sort of thing. So they're getting frustrated too because they're trying to get it centralized here in Mexico City. So everything is announced the same going to each local airport, but it's just not there yet. And so you're right. You go to Cabo, it might be the exact same process you're used to seeing, but they expect a, a new permit each time. You go to Puerto Vallarta, they might say, well, actually, the single entry on authorization allows you to come back for 180 days. So right now we say take caution and make sure that every time you go to Mexico, you're ensuring that your permit is in place regardless if you have in hand one of those 180 day single entry authorizations, because that might not be accepted based on what aircraft you're using who you have on board and where you're going. All right. The question that begs to be asked, you know, there's going to be at least a couple people that show up having done none of this and having no idea that any of this has taken place, right? And they don't have the permit. Have we figured out yet what happens if you just show up in blatant disregard of the new policy and don't have this entry permit? Well, a lot of times arriving in can get done. It's the departing out that would be the problem. So say you do nothing and you are coming in to drop passengers off and heading right back home, that's probably not going to happen. They're going to get held. They're going to want to know what's going on. Why did you not uh, provide your pre-authorization, provide the necessary documentation? Now, if you go down to Cabo and you're planning a week there and you land and, and you play ignorant and you work with a, a local agent or somebody that can help you out, they may be able to get it done in that week's period before you depart. And uh, now that's not a game you want to play. I don't ever suggest you going anywhere these days, especially to Mexico during a changeover of policy without doing your due diligence and getting your pre-authorization in place. So we have not had that happen, no. So I couldn't speak to the actual pilot experience, but that's highly not highly not recommended. Just so we're clear, this is not like the old days where a crisp $100 bill could get you out of basically anything. <laughs> we, you know, like, who knows? So that, what? What's the problem? I thought uh, we were friends. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's not something that you can promote out there. But I'm, I'm sure that I'm sure that uh, like my first name, the Benjamins out there can get things yeah. done. I said, you know, that's inflation right. Inflation is very high. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right, right, exactly. If, no, it's two hundred now. It's, it's now three hundred. Yeah, exactly. Okay, well, you negotiate it to two hundred, obviously, but. Anyway. <laughs> so, Ben, are your clients getting this permit prior to departure from, let's say, the United States? I know in my experience, we would usually land and then the permit would get handed to us once we landed. But are you waiting for that permit to come before you're even sending people out? Or how does that work? No. So it's the same process. So uh, these authorizations are getting confirmed before operators leave for peace of mind. But these permits are still being issued before departure. So at some point when they're on the ground. So, of course, if it's a quick turn or a tech stop of some sort, it's being issued on the ground there while you're feeling up and dropping off packs or picking up packs. If you're staying there, it generally gets issued either on arrival or when you come back to the aircraft on departure. So you do want to do your due diligence and make sure that's ready to go because you, without it, we have heard several stories across the industry of operators being held on departure for several yeah. hours because of that, not having that permit in hand. Okay. And it's still unknown. I've read some different things online that, and I think you alluded to it earlier. If let's say myself and my co-pilot got a permit with our names on it and then a list of some passengers, and then we went back another time within that 180 days, same pilots, but maybe different passengers. 
it's still unknown if that permit is considered valid. Is that true? That's where the interpretation of the local airports are coming into play. So, wow. Well, what does this permit cost? The single entry authorization? Yeah. That's a good question. I haven't seen the invoices come back yet on it yet. We're used to with these blanket permits paying several thousand dollars for them and then it being in effect for the whole year. But with the single entry authorizations, they used to be, you know, in the range of around a thousand. Wow. So it's not something where it's like, oh, we got one more person, better safe than sorry. We'll just get another. Yeah. You know, it's actually there's financial impact there that is considerable. That's true. I, but I would say that the financial impact of obtaining a, another permit would be less than the, the financial yeah. impact of getting stuck in Cabo for another day. So Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So still more to be determined, but it sounds like, uh, yeah, it was funny. I got that interior, exterior shot of my airplane, the interior diagram sent in, and we have a trip coming up, and I, I sent it in, and they seemed to say, okay, no problem, and, and then that was that. But uh, any other gotchas or any other things that uh, folks need to be aware of uh, regarding this? So if you are a charter operator, not a whole lot has changed. However, I do want to mention that you do have to have a blanket permit in process or even confirm now if you want to go to select airports. There's, I think, six or seven airports that are, have been saying, if you don't have that charter permit in place for the, that blanket permit for the year, then we're not going to let you come to our airport. And one example is uh, Cabo San Lucas, the private airport in Cabo, Mike Sierra Lima. That one's been one of the several that's done that. Huh. And you have to get that one every year? You do, and it can take up to, I've seen, between the longer time frame, two to three months. Well, that's no big deal. No one's really going to Cabo in January through March. Yeah. That's kind of a slow <laughs> season there. So, yeah. Maybe once AFAC in this country realizes how much revenue they're pulling from their own country, they'll still. Get on the same wow. page. Yeah, that's so. crazy. So I've actually had kind of a hard time getting a definitive answer on this. What class medical do you need to fly into Mexico? Right. So this is another one where it depends on what airport you're flying to. Uh, and, of course. And, and, yeah. So and now if you're <laughs> going to um, Cabo, we've seen operators travel with a, a wide variety. But what I would say is we try to always have the PIC have a first class place. And if your PIC has a first class in place, 98% of the time, you're going to avoid any issues. If you got, it's a two-pilot aircraft, of course, then a SIC, we do recommend just both having the first class because then you're 100% in the green. But we have seen second class medicals work in some parts of Mexico. Okay. Better safe than sorry. That's the real uh, message I, we're, we're getting from you today, Ben. <laughs> That's CYA. Well, and then one more. So you know how like if you're coming from the Caribbean and you need to tech stop in Mexico, you can only go to two points of entry, right? It's like Cozumel and some other one, right? Yes. So that's still the case. That hasn't changed. But there's a caveat on there that says you may be able to gain authorization to stop somewhere else. Is that possible? Like in reality? It hasn't been, no. We're still using Tapachula and Cozumel as our two airports, and everybody is normally just fine with that. And we, we actually haven't had that come up in quite some time of, of trying to make an exception, and I haven't seen that happen since the pre-COVID days. Got it. Okay. He's trying, Max is trying to extract some extra free knowledge just out curious. of me. He's <laughs> trying to, oh, we got you. Well, we got you on the phone. Uh, right. so, well, well, we appreciate your expertise, Ben. If any listeners have any more questions or need any assistance, what's the best way for them to get a hold of you? Absolutely. So I have my personal email, which is reachable 24-7 at bfulleritpops.com. And our operations team is available 24-7, which is operations at itpops.com. Awesome. We will have both of those in the show notes for listeners if they need to reach out. Ben, we appreciate your expertise. Thank you so much. Any last questions, Max, while we got him on the phone? No, that's it. Any, uh, I'll save the rest. South the American uh, overflight permit questions? No, <laughs> no. Okay. Some, <laughs> some Cuba stuff, but we'll save it for next time. All right. Ready to go. All right, Ben. Thank you, uh, Ben Fuller from International Trip Planning Service. Thank you for your expertise. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. You have a good one. Thanks, Ben. All right, man. See, see you. Ya. All right, that is going to do it for another hot. We still haven't figured out the name of this hodgepodge episode. The yet. Smorgasbord. Smorgasbord 280 350 Showdown episode. Um, thanks to uh, Ben for joining us. Thanks to all our listeners for writing slapping reviews and uh, insightful emails. 
Uh, info at 215podcast.com is the address if you want to get involved in the conversation. Thanks to our sponsors, Harvey Watt and Advanced Air Crew Academy, Tim Pope, Varus Jet Sales, and the Air Comp Calculator. We'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, remember. Flexibility is the key to air power. See ya. Bye-bye. The statements made in this show are our own opinions and do not reflect, nor were they under any direction from any of our employers.